Hello, I'm Matt Lewis, I'm an author and historian, and I'm here today at the Tower of London with History Hit to talk about one of this fortress's greatest mysteries. Over 500 years ago, two small boys were last recorded playing within the walls of this building, and then they disappeared. But we're not here to talk about a murder. We're here to consider the possible survival of the princes in the tower. It's spring, 1483. Edward IV, the first Yorkist King of England, has been on the throne for 22 years. The Wars of the Roses seems like a distant memory. There's a spectre of war with France, but then war with France isn't always all that bad. Edward is the tallest man ever to have sat on the throne of England or Britain at six foot four. He's loved, he's affable, and he's an undefeated warrior on the battlefields of the Wars of the Roses. And not many people can say that. But on the 9th of April, the king dies unexpectedly. The kingdom is sent into political shockwaves. There's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that Edward has two sons, an heir and a spare. His oldest son is immediately proclaimed King Edward V on his father's death. The bad news is that both sons are still just young boys. The new King Edward is just 12 and his younger brother Richard only nine years old. But there's more good news. They have an uncle. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, is summoned from his lands in the north of England to come south and help his nephew manage the kingdom until he comes of age. But Edward V is never crowned King of England. Instead, Uncle Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, becomes the infamous King Richard III. What happens to the boys is unknown. They were held for a while in what was then called the Garden Tower, rechristened the Bloody Tower for the dark murders believed to have taken place within its walls. Their bodies are lost to history. The Battle of Bosworth, two years later, becomes Richard's comeuppance, but it also meant that he could never disclose what had really happened to his two young nephews. That would be a story that others would write. So if the story that we have of the princes in the tower is so neat and tidy, why has it fascinated us for generations? Why does it inspire heated debate on social media today, just as it would have done in the taverns of 15th century England? It's partly because it's so horrific. It's two small children, 12 and nine, being murdered by their uncle. They're last recorded playing, shooting bows and arrows out on the grass here underneath the garden tower. There's a fairy tale element to it, the wicked uncle, who steals the throne from his nephews and has them done away with in the night. It's also partly due to the portraiture that Victorian painters have left us. They're always painted with their lovely flowing blonde locks, clinging together, looking off in opposite directions as if they're just waiting for their murderers to come in and finish them off. In truth, the boys grew up separately. Edward spent his years from the age of two in the Welsh marches at Ludlow, training how to rule a kingdom. Richard was brought up at court with his mother and his sisters. The boys would have been virtual strangers to each other. And yet we're sold an image of them clinging to each other as a single unit, sharing a single doomed fate. But it's also a mystery and everybody loves a mystery. The fact is, we just don't know what happened to the princes in the tower. Richard III has to be the obvious suspect in any murder inquiry. But how far would Agatha Christie have got if it was always the obvious suspect that did it? Fast forward 200 years and the mystery appeared to have been solved when workmen removing a staircase outside the White Tower here stumbled across the remains of two children. King Charles II proclaimed them to be those of the princes in the tower and had them placed in an urn in Westminster Abbey. There's a plaque on the wall up here that marks the spot near where they were found. Case closed? I don't think so. In 1933, those remains were exhumed from their urn and subjected to scientific examination. They were unable to age the skeletons. They couldn't date the remains. They couldn't even tell whether they belonged to boys or girls. They found animal bones and all kinds of dirt mixed in from the rubbish pile that these bones had been collected from. So we can't be sure that those are the princes in the tower in that urn in Westminster Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's fascinating that a king who reigned for less than two years, over 500 years ago, should still inspire such interest today. So why is it that we're still obsessed with King Richard III? Doubtless the fate of his two nephews plays into the mystery, but it's more than that. There's a sense that he was wronged by history, that there's a problem that needs to be fixed with his reputation. Richard was 30 years old when he became King of England. In the years before that, he'd grown up in the heat of the Wars of the Roses during some of the worst years. He spent two periods in exile when he was eight and again when he was 18. He'd fought in battles and been successful despite his scoliosis. He'd been involved in an invasion of France. He'd led a campaign against the Scots. All of this before he even came near to the throne of England. And that man that we see at work in the North, carving out a strong reputation for himself as a champion of justice, equity, and the common man, is almost impossible to reconcile with the monster of 1483 that history has bequeathed to us. I've been fascinated by Richard III for years now, and the more I read, the more fascinated I become, and the more questions I have rather than answers. Almost everything about him is so cloaked in mystery and smoke and mirrors that two people can read the same piece of evidence and come to two very different conclusions. I see a man who was ahead of his time, who was interested in social justice issues, and that made him a bit of a threat to the powers that be in the country, to those who benefited from the status quo. And perhaps this plays into why he has such a poor reputation. For me, he doesn't deserve to be remembered as a child-killing monster. So I would challenge the commonly held belief that Richard murdered the princes. It's not impossible, but there are holes in the theory. We're here now in the Bloody Tower, so named for its brutal association with the slaughter of two young boys that would become known as the princes in the tower. It was in a room just like this, maybe even this very room, that the boys awaited their fate in 1483. What would their Uncle Richard have in store for them? If there were two murders here in 1483, then Richard III has to be everybody's prime suspect. Any murder inquiry is going to look for a motive, the means and the opportunity. And Richard III definitely has all three of those. His motive is to secure the throne for himself and perhaps even to protect his own child his future dynasty. The means is easy to see. Richard is the king. He can do whatever he wants. He can have them murdered on his instructions. And the opportunity is there for all to see. The boys are in Richard's care in the spring and summer of 1483. If I had to boil my problem with Richard III's guilt in the murder of the princes in the tower down to one element, it would be the motive. And not because I don't think he had one, I accept that he may have wished to kill them for his own security. But if Richard orders the murder of his two nephews to secure the throne for himself, he needs everybody to know that the princes are dead and can never be used as a threat against him. It was commonplace at this time to display the bodies of high profile casualties so that everyone was certain that they were dead. Eyebrows would certainly be raised if Richard displayed the bodies of his nephews but people didn't necessarily have to believe Richard's excuse. He could say they died of natural causes. He could say someone else had murdered them. It didn't really matter whether people believed him. It only mattered that people knew they were dead. If Richard ordered the murders of his two young nephews and then kept it a secret for the rest of his life, he killed them for no material gain. But what if for 500 years, we've been asking the wrong question altogether? What if in our desperation to find the brutal murderer of two young children, we've overlooked another possibility? If we allow for a moment that there is no certainty about the fate of the princes in the tower, if we allow that as far as we can tell from the evidence, Richard III wasn't the kind of man to indulge in murder as a first resort. If we allow also that his silence on the matter would defeat the purpose of the murders, then perhaps for a moment, we can allow for the possibility of the survival of the princes in the tower. So I know what you're thinking. If I'm suggesting that the princes in the tower survived beyond 1483, there must be some evidence of this. Well, yes, 
a no. We have some snippets, some pieces of information, but nothing conclusive. Although I'd say the same thing about their murders too. We have hints at their continued existence, but nothing that we can call conclusive. This is in part because we know that Henry VII went about destroying some paperwork when he came to the throne. We know, for example, that he destroyed the Act of Parliament that had made Edward IV's children illegitimate and which had allowed Richard III to take the throne. He has that struck from Parliament's rolls without having it read, which is completely against the usual protocol. What we don't know is what else Henry destroyed in his efforts to cover up the possible continued existence of the princes in the tower. And yet we do have odd little snippets. In the wardrobe rolls that were compiled in 1484, for the materials that were used at the coronation of Richard III, we have an odd reference in which the man compiling the wardrobe rolls says that there was material that was bought for Lord Edward, son of the late King Edward IV. So this makes it clear that there was an intention that Edward V should attend his uncle's coronation in 1483. It also tells us that Edward's name wasn't taboo by the time these records were compiled in 1484, the clerk felt comfortable enough referring to the former Edward V as Lord Edward. There are other snippets too that may hint at the continued existence of at least one of the princes in the tower. We have a warrant that was issued in 1485 for the Lord Bastard, two doublets of silk, one jacket of silk, one gown of cloth, two shirts and two bonnets. And a little bit later on, we have another for leavened bread allowed for the Lord Bastard riding to Calais, 12 pence, and paid for a pike given to Master Brackenbury, constable of the tower, who at that time returned from Calais from the Lord Bastard, three shillings, four pence. So these could be little references to Edward V surviving the reign of Richard III that slipped through the net of the early Tudor government. So we don't see direct documentary confirmation of the continued existence of the princes in the tower after 1485. And perhaps we shouldn't expect to. But what we can think about is the actions of those people who were close to the princes, who would have been affected by their continued survival. We know, for example, that in April 1484, their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, comes out of sanctuary at Westminster Abbey and gives her daughters into the care of Richard III. Now, if this was a man that she was utterly convinced had just brutally murdered her two sons, why on earth would she give him custody of her daughters? The timing here is critical. In April 1484, Richard III's parliament has just sat. He's had his title to the crown enshrined in law. He's put down rebellions the previous October. He's as secure as he's ever going to be on the throne of England. Did he pick this moment to tell Elizabeth Woodville that her sons were actually alive. So I would liken the idea of the continued survival of the princes in the tower to something like a black hole in space. We can't see a black hole and we can't see real evidence of the continued survival of the princes in the tower, but we know that black holes are there because we see the gravitational effect that they have on things around them. And in the case of the princes in the tower, that's the effect that they have on people. And okay, during the life of Richard III, it's probably not good policy to ask the king how his nephews are. A little bit too much like putting your neck on the block. But after he's died in 1485, it would serve the early Tudor government security to clean the matter up, to let everybody know that the princes were dead and that Richard III had killed them. When Henry VII takes the throne, he re-legitimises the children of Edward IV because he wants to marry one of the prince's sisters, Elizabeth of York. But when he does that, he immediately hands Edward V a perfectly good and perfectly legal claim to the throne of England. And Henry has won the Battle of Bosworth with the backing of disaffected Yorkists who would flock to Edward V's cause. And yet at no point after 1485, does Henry VII ever make a public statement on the fate of the princes in the tower. He doesn't accuse Richard III of murdering them. The prince's sister, Elizabeth of York, becomes the first Tudor queen. And even when it would suit the security of her dynasty, when her children are in line for the throne of England, she still never accuses her uncle of murdering her brothers. 
The princes have four other sisters, all of whom live well into the 16th century, and none of them ever accuse Richard of killing the princes in the tower. People always ask, if the princes were still alive in 1483, why didn't Richard III produce them? Why didn't he show everybody that they were still alive? I would wonder why Richard would want to do that. To keep them in everybody's minds, to admit that they have some kind of hold over him, to alert people to where they might be being held. All of those would be a recipe for disaster. So if the princes in the tower were still alive at the end of 1485, and it's a big if, I'll grant you that, then the question is, what happened to them next? In 1487, there was a plot that threatened the newly won throne of Henry VII. The scheme became known as the Lambert Simnel Affair, named for the young boy who was supposedly at its centre. The traditional story tells us that Lambert Simnel was a boy from Oxford who was plucked up by a priest and trained to impersonate Edward Earl of Warwick, the last male line heir to the House of York. The big problem for the plot was that Warwick himself was a prisoner here at the Tower of London. But this boy, Lambert Simnel, undergoes a coronation in Dublin. There's an invasion of England landing in the northwest and the Battle of Stoke Field in the East Midlands, the final pitched battle of the Wars of the Roses. The rebel army is crushed and Lambert is captured on the battlefield. Henry VII shows him mercy and puts him to work in the royal kitchens. And Lambert is last heard of in the 1520s, working as a royal falconer at the court of King Henry VIII. After that, he disappears and what happens to him in the end, nobody knows. There's another version of this story though, with a little bit of documentary evidence to back it up. The early Tudor chronicler, Polydore Virgil, who was hired by the first Tudor king to write a history of the kings of England, talks about the Lambert Simnel affair being an effort to restore Edward to the throne. Now, Edward, Earl of Warwick, had never been king, so he couldn't be restored to the throne. The only Edward that you could restore to a throne in 1487, if he was still alive, was Edward V. Bernard André, the blind Tudor court poet, wrote a history of Henry VII too. In general, it's very glowing about his master. And when it comes to the Lambert Simnel affair, Bernard André is clear that it was a fraud, that Lambert Simnel was a fake. But he also says of the people in Ireland, they proclaimed with wicked intent that a certain boy born the son of a cobbler or a miller was the son of Edward IV. And so he tells us that this was an effort to place one of Edward IV's sons onto the throne, not the Earl of Warwick. Edward IV's son, named Edward, means Edward V. Bernard André repeats this a little bit later, and then he tells us some interesting detail about an exchange that took place at court, as Henry VII is getting information out of Ireland about the emerging plot there. He sends a herald over who volunteers to go because he says he can identify this boy if he really is who he claims to be. And so the herald goes to Ireland. He comes back, and unfortunately for Henry VII, he can't say that this boy isn't who he claims to be. Now the herald tells us that he was finally accepted as Edward's son by many prudent men. So again, he's being accepted as Edward IV's son, which makes him Edward V. Lambert Simnel undergoes a coronation at Dublin Cathedral before he leaves Ireland. Now, why would that be? No other pretender undergoes a coronation ceremony in the same way that Lambert Simnel does. And if we think about Edward V, then a coronation was the missing piece of his kingship. He was proclaimed king in the immediate aftermath of his father's death, but he was never crowned. So was this ceremony in Dublin an effort to complete the kingship of Edward V? We have no information that really comes from inside the Yorkist camp during this whole affair. Lots of the records in Ireland are destroyed in the aftermath of the Lambert Simnel affair. And we don't know the regnal number that was used by this King Edward. We're told in the traditional story that it's King Edward VI because he was the Earl of Warwick. But what if it was Edward V? What if the reason all of those records were completely destroyed was because they pointed towards the survival of one of the princes in the tower? So I think that the Lambert Simnel affair may have been a plot in favour of King Edward V, 
and that the Tudor government were able to use the fact that there were two Edwards to pass this off as a much less threatening bid to put Edward Earl of Warwick onto the throne. Lambert Simnel was just a boy who was collected on the battlefield and offered a cushy job in the royal kitchens if he would pretend to be the boy who had led the army. What we don't know is what happened to the real Edward V if he was at the Battle of Stoke Field. He could have been killed in the fighting. He could have escaped. He could have been taken prisoner. And this boy used to cover up the whole affair. Lambert Simnel was medieval fake news. And what of the younger brother, Richard? The Perkin Warbeck plot provides us with one possible answer. There was a second pretender who arrived to trouble King Henry VII. Two princes in the tower and now two pretenders. Maybe it's a coincidence and maybe not. Perkin Warbeck, like Lambert Simnel, arrived in Ireland in 1491. We're told in the official story that he was a boy from Tournai, the son of a boatman, and that he was trained to impersonate the younger of the princes in the tower, Richard, Duke of York. Perkin spent years touring Europe, successfully passing himself off as Prince Richard. Eventually, he was captured by Henry VII and gave a confession that he was really named Perkin Warbeck and was no prince at all. But why do we believe the official story that the Tudor government has given us? Once more, there's more to this than meets the eye. Perkin Warbeck was courted by the crowned heads of Europe, King James IV of Scotland, Charles VIII of France. Now, no doubt those are two men who would want to cause problems for the King of England. John, King of Denmark, threw his lot in with Perkin. Emperor Maximilian was Perkin's staunchest supporter throughout his claims to be Prince Richard. But it's more than just wanting to cause problems for the King of England. Being a king was a sacred thing, and no king would claim that a, a boy from Tournai was a genuine prince. Their crowns were sacred and they wouldn't belittle that by passing off a nobody as a king. Perkin landed at Deal in Kent in an effort to invade England, but he was driven away. He made it to Ireland before moving on to Scotland, where he was welcomed by King James IV. After a failed attempt to invade England across the Scottish border, Perkin travelled to the southwest and tried to stir up trouble in Cornwall, where there'd recently been a tax rebellion. He took an army to Taunton. He was proclaimed King Richard IV on Bodmin Moor, but when a royal army approached, he lost his nerve and he ran away. Perkin was dragged out of Bewley Abbey, removed from sanctuary there to face Henry VII's justice. He would eventually give a confession that he was a fraud, that he'd impersonated Richard, Duke of York. But there are serious problems. This confession seems to have been extracted under torture. Bernard Andre, the blind poet who worked at the court of Henry VII, recorded that Perkin was a fraud, but says that when he was brought before King Henry VII, he was beaten black and blue by the royal servants, and they laughed at him and mocked his appearance. If a confession is given under torture today, we would say that it's highly suspect and unreliable. And the same would have been true in the 1490s. The Spanish ambassador de Puebla wrote home after seeing Perkin in London that he was disfigured, suggesting the beatings continued. De Puebla feared that Perkin wouldn't live much longer if he continued to be treated this way. This sketch was drawn earlier in the 1490s to support Perkin's claim. Was all this violence an effort to cover up the fact that he looked so much like Edward IV, the man he claimed was his father? Perkin was eventually installed at the Tower of London here, and then he became embroiled in another setup. He was put into contact with Edward Earl of Warwick, the other Yorkist heir, who was a prisoner at the Tower of London, and the two were encouraged to plot an escape together. They were caught before they even made it out of their cell doors, and both men were sentenced to death. The traditional story suggests that the Earl of Warwick was put to death at the wishes of the Spanish, who wanted the last Yorkist heir dead before their daughter Catherine of Aragon arrived in England to marry the Tudor Prince. But what if in reality the Spanish were more concerned about Perkin Warbeck? What if he was the real Richard Duke of York, heir to the Yorkist crown of England? What if Edward Earl of Warwick was sacrificed 
to cover up the murder of the younger of the princes in the tower. There are lots of other theories about what may have happened to the princes in the tower if they survived beyond 1485. One of my favourites was put forward by amateur art historian Jack Leslaw, and he believed that he'd uncovered the younger of the princes in the tower, hidden in a family portrait painted by Hans Holbein. This is a portrait of Sir Thomas More's family, and More, of course, is the man who gave Richard his really dark reputation as a child murderer. So Leslaw's suggestion is that this is a big plot to cover up the continued existence of the princes in the tower. There's lots of evidence in the picture that Leslaw points to. The young man arriving at the back of the painting, who looks like he's walking through a wall and in a hurry, is often identified as John Harris, one of Thomas More's secretaries. But Leslaw believed there was a lot more to this figure. The name above his head, Johannes Heresius, is the only name in the painting that doesn't have a capitalised surname. And Johannes Heresius can be translated from Latin as John the Rightful Heir. And Leslaw's suggestion was that this figure was really Dr John Clement, Thomas More's son-in-law, and that John Clement was an assumed identity for Richard, Duke of York, the younger of the princes in the tower. This figure stands underneath a canopy that's decorated with royal fleur-de-lis. His head is the highest in all of the painting, a position usually reserved for the most important person. And I think, interestingly, the person that he stands next to, marked on the painting as Henry Pattinson, Thomas More's fool, bears a striking resemblance to another Henry. He wears a white and red rose badge on his hat and a cross of St George. And for me, he looks an awful lot like King Henry VIII. And John Clement's head is just above his, suggesting he's just a little bit more important than Henry VIII. The traditional story of the princes in the tower insists that Richard III, in a drastic change of personality, murders two young children, his nephews, in a desperate bid to secure his throne. But as we've seen, there are problems with his motive. There's no real evidence that there were any murders at all, and no bodies have ever been conclusively identified as those of the two boys. We've had two pretenders, and there are countless other theories that the boys survived beyond 1485. Perhaps in our desperation to find a killer, we've left one idea on the shelf gathering dust for too long. Instead of working out who was the murderer, perhaps we should be talking more about the survival of the princes in the tower. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.